It has been a while since I have been on this stage and preached the Word of God. And it makes me smile to think about that because I, I hope that you'll respond to this. It is an awesome thing in a church like this that we have the people who can get on this stage and bring it. Would you agree with that? I, I sit and just smile because that's where my heart really is at as I think about this transition and what God's doing in my heart is to be able to pour into this next generation, to watch them carry a mantle. Because here's the deal. People ask me, why do you think the change is? Well, I could do it till I'm 90 and, and then you can die and then feel good about that fact. But here's the thing. When, when do we do it? it it's no one, no one, I can't answer the question. You can answer the question, except only God can answer that question, Right. When is the right time? Because we all know that time is, is going to happen, right? It's going to happen. I've, I've never been in a church and the pastor was 149 years old and he was still going at it. You know, it, not been in there. And I say that because this afternoon is a picture of it. I was ordained back in the early 2000s and it, it felt it was the most amazing thing. And yet I didn't wasn't able to have a lot of my church around this church because it was out in the Black Hills. And I remember yet kneeling at that altar with my wife beside me and I couldn't stop the tears. I just couldn't stop the tears. And then my father came to the stage and prayed over me. And that was a third generation. And this afternoon, out of my family, four generations of people who are called, who are picking up a mantle which is part of what God does, right? The church has been around for 2,000 years and God has ordained pastors and they've come and they transitioned, they died and the next generation carried it on and it is just the coolest thing. And so I, I want you to think about for a moment and I'm not just saying it's because of my daughter. I, for me, obviously, I'm not gonna ever apologize for it. It's a pretty awesome thing as a dad to have your da daughter called of God and wanting to be ordained and has done the work and it's a lot of work. But I want you to think about her kneeling on that altar and her church family is around her. I don't know what you're doing this afternoon. I will promise you it'll be cooler in here than it will be out there. That I can promise you. But I will tell you it'll be a lot cooler in here than anything you think you might be doing because God is doing something unbelievable when he calls someone and sets them apart. And so I hope that you'll come and wrap around her and her and Noah. Uh, it'll, it'll just be the best hour. It's just going to be such an awesome time. And, I, and then at five, I want to continue on with this transition. Once a month, I've set aside. And this evening at five o'clock, our district superintendent, Wes Smith, will be with me. And the whole goal of that is for you. We're in this together. This is not a loan thing. This is a church thing. And this is a moment that, that any questions you have, this is a great environment and Wes and I will be here and we're gonna continue to walk through this together. Here's the reality, folks. It's going to happen. It will happen. It always happens. But the beautiful thing is, many of you grew up in a church where about every three years, a pastor came and a pastor went. It's a pretty awesome thing that we're more about culture than we are candidates, if you will. And I've been here for 25 years. And it's an awesome thing, right? I mean, if I was staying on the average, I would have left a long time ago because they say the average pastor in America stays around fully around three years at a church. Now, keep in mind, I'm part of that average. And so you would understand that pastors come and they go pretty quickly. And I remember when I moved here, I told my district superintendent at the time was Isaac Smith. And I told Isaac, I said, if it's a good fit, I'd just as soon you leave me alone. I kind of want to grow with these people. And uh, I just never thought 25 years would come this quick. But I think all of the older crowd would say, it is a quick trip. My dad is so right, isn't it? It is a quick trip. And uh, I can't believe I'm a grandpa and I've got a third one coming. Um, it's just a quick trip. And I was thinking about it this morning, actually, when I was in the shower. And I was just thinking about the fact that it won't be long. And uh, all of a sudden, these young grandchildren, uh, Lord may honor me with it. I'm going to watch them get married and think, my goodness. It just comes and it goes so quick. 
but the church has been around for 2000 years, people. And I love the church. Amen to that. Love the church. If you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to go to Philippians chapter two. Philippians chapter two. And as you're going there, I just want to, if you will, take you on a little memory, all right? Down a little memory lane. Because life is full of rules, isn't it? There was a lot of things that we learned as a child, and then some things change, some things stay, very few, but there's rules. Life is full of rules. As a child, as we grow into an adult, right? Life is full of rules. Doesn't mean that you necessarily keep them, Like, let me help you with it. I don't know if you know this or not, but when you come to a stop sign, you're supposed to come to a complete stop, okay? See, we don't get it. Isn't it interesting, us older people, trust me, I've watched a lot of you drive. And so we don't. It's interesting that we're always telling our kids to keep the rules, and yet they're watching us on the interstate going 83. That's not the speed limit, right? Which sort of says we don't really obey the rules. You can do what you want with it, but that's a fact of life. But there were some that just, if you will, just, here's one I was told when I was growing up. Don't cross your eyes. They'll eventually stay that way. How many heard that? Okay. Keep your hand up if you've ever met anyone. (laughs) Anyone. You know, one person that crossed their eyes and they stayed that way. Okay. Interesting rule, isn't it? I actually love that one. How about this one? Eat lots of carrots. It will help you their vision. Now, I was a kid growing up. First of all, kids hate vegetables, all right? And I think it was a way that we were sort of suckering them and thinking to, them, to ourselves, right? Eat lots of carrots. It'll help your vision. We we're trying to get them to eat the vegetables. But the fact is, I don't know about you, but when I was growing up, I hated carrots. And it, it never affected my vision. I... I Okay, next rule. Okay, how how about this one? You can do anything you want when you grow up. Is that is that work for anybody? Uh, let me let me help you with it. Has any anybody been watching the Olympics? Just a little fact that'll help you with it. You can be anything you want when you grow up. Everybody, look up here. There's Olympics going on. It's in Paris. I'm here. <laughs> in case you missed it, just let's, you can be anything you want when you grow up. The Olympics are in Paris. Like you, I've been watching the Olympics. It's, it's crazy. I, I dreamed that. I really dreamed it. I thought it'd be really cool to be an Olympian. Felt like I trained, I tried. You can't be everything you, by the way, it's sort of unbiblical anyway, and we shouldn't tell our kids they can be anything they want when they grow up. You know what we should be telling them and helping them? Discover what God had purposed and planned for their life. Because I will promise you, you may not agree with this, but I will promise you, and I know several people that are struggling greatly because God had called them and they chose something else. Some of your unhappiness might be the sheer fact that you might, in the world might say you're successful, but you're not doing what God asked you to do. And you know it. You know it. But, but here's one. Say your prayers before you go to bed. How, how many remember that one? I mean, that was a rule. You take it, you say your prayers. Go to, by the way, wouldn't it make more sense to tell our kids, say your prayers before you get out of bed in the morning? I don't know about you, but I need a lot more help at the beginning of the day than I do at the end of the day. Because in the morning, I'm like, God, I really need your help. At the end of the day, it's like, where were you, God? You know, I mean, I, I'm just telling you. Right. And, then, and then the prayer that we taught our kids. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. Remember, we're six. If I die before I wake, 
I pray the Lord my soul to take. Sleep nice now. I mean, have you, have you ever thought about that? Rules. Oh my. But I think there's one, and you probably know where I'm going with this, that I think it was more than just a rule. It's an interesting one, but I think it's a rule that we should all not just live by, but we should all actually live out. And it's a rule that we've come to know as the golden rule. I'll say more about it, but I want you to look at the screen if you would. And I want everybody to read it out loud with me. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Let's read it again. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. It is a rule that we learned. Believe it or not, it's simple, yet it's genius. And what's crazy about it, it is the most universal famed words that Jesus ever said. It's quoted by people who don't even believe there is a Christ. It's a crazy thing. In fact, some have said that these words transformed the Sermon on the Mount. And in that moment when Jesus spoke them, the Sermon on the Mount reached its highest summit. In fact, I quote, Jesus' words were the capstone of his whole message. They were the pinnacle of his entire ministry. In other words, if we could just get this one thing right, it would change everything. Find, I just find it interesting. It is so often quoted, you hear it all the time. In so many forms, treat others the way you want to be treated, whatever it is, do unto others the, what, the very thing that you would want them to do unto you. And I want you to think about that right now in the most quoted, if you will, words of Christ. Think about our nation right now. So what is it about it that we can say something, but we don't really live something? That we can quote it, but maybe we don't really believe it. Or at least it doesn't apply to us and maybe we're just trying to get it to apply to everybody else. I don't know, I'm not gonna argue it. But I will say this, if you got your notes, take them out because there's two fundamental keys that I believe we better get if we think we're actually gonna understand this rule. And then we're gonna read from Philippians as Paul helps us with it. But here's the first one. Jesus' words, these words, only apply to those who deeply wish to please him. I want you to think about that. The golden rule means nothing if you really don't want to please Jesus. Please don't miss that. You can spend the rest of your life going, well, you just need to treat others the way you want to be treated. That is just, uh, 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 it's just bah humbug. It is not real. Unless in your heart deeply, you want to please Jesus. And so I ask that question right now. Do you really want to please Jesus? Was that your focus this morning when you got out of bed? I just want to please you. Is that your goal when you go throughout your day, when you're at work? I just want to please you, God, and you alone. You see, listen to this very carefully. According to Jesus, how you and I treat others is the evidence in how much we actually treasure God. I could go on and on and show you verses of it, in 1 John, it says this, how can you say you love God and you've not seen him and hate your brother? You know what John says? God's not in you. He's not in you. It is the evidence, Jesus said, you wanna know who my disciples are? Watch how they love one another. It's the evidence. Our ability to love is the evidence of how much we actually treasure God. That's why I'll say it again. His words only apply to those who really want to please him. Our love for others is the fruit of our love toward God. That's why John wrote, we love because he first loved us. How many times you heard me say, this is never the problem this is. If you're struggling here, it's because you're struggling here. 
And if you want to get it right here, it starts here. That's why I tell you, there is no marriage without God in the center of it. You just have a piece of paper. That's all you have. You can call it what you want. God is the author of what marriage is. He is the center of it. And marriage is to be the example of that relationship we have with him. Do you really desire to deeply please him? Here is the second thing I want to say before we jump into this. This needed change, because I believe we need to learn to love others, right? In a God way, this needed change can only come when we fully surrender to God's will. You have to die to self. This is what Paul said, by the way, and it's not the passage we're in yet, but here's what he wrote in Romans. I have discovered this simple principle of life, and I think all of us will, because I've discovered it too. You know what it is? That when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. Anybody discover that principle? I don't know about you, I have. Every day, I want to do the right thing. I don't understand why I'm so in love with God and then I get behind the wheel of a car. You know, it, it's just, it's the craziest thing. It's the littlest things can jump in the way. Does anybody feel that at times? The littlest thing, it's like, what am I doing? What was I thinking? That simple principle, I want to do what's right, but it seems time and time again, I do what is wrong. And here's why Paul wrote that. Because our ability to do what is right, you ready for this? Starts with, everybody look up here, doing what's right. You and I don't have the power to build a marriage. We don't have the power to raise a family. We don't have the power to go into a journey with a friendship. We don't have it. But Paul said, but all things through Christ. I can, right? Through Christ. That's why he goes on to write, oh, what a miserable person I am. In fact, look at some right now and say, oh, what a miserable person I am. Come on, look at him. Come on, own it. Without Jesus, we're in trouble, right, people? We need Jesus. So Paul understood this. This is the author of two thirds of the New Testament. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? And here it is. I want everybody to look at the screen. I want you to read the answer out loud with me. Thank God the answer is in Jesus Christ, my Lord. And in those words, we get the fundamental, the key, the essence, the substance to the golden rule, Jesus. Jesus. When we think about how do we treat others the way we're going to be treated? Jesus. I want to please him and it starts with him. Jesus. He's the picture. He's the example. He's the walking, talking model by which you and I are to live. Jesus. Say that name with me. Jesus. So with that being said, I'm going to ask you to stand. If you can. And I'm going to read, and you can follow along with me, Philippians 2, beginning with verse 1. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. It is on the screen, and I'm not covering all the verses. I'm going to be reading 1 through 5, if you will, but not all of them. But here's what he writes. If there is any encouragement from belonging to Christ, if there is any comfort from his love, if there's any fellowship together in the Holy Spirit, notice what he just said. If you really, really want to please him. If you get encouragement by saying, I'm a child of the king. If you really get what he did on the cross. If you really understand this, here's what he says. Then agree wholeheartedly, wholeheartedly, fully with each other to loving one another. And working together with one mind and with one purpose. And then he tells us how we are to do this. And here it comes. We are not selfish. We do not try to impress others. We are humbled, thinking of others as better than ourselves. Father, I trust that you are going to speak. 
And I pray that not only these become words that we've known for such a long time, this one verse in Matthew in the Sermon on the Mount, that you call us to do unto others as we'd want them to do unto us, that we get the essence of it from what Paul wrote. I trust that you will speak in Jesus' name. And everyone says, amen. Amen. You may be seated. I want you to repeat after me. A changed life life. is a changed life. life. And can I add something? And it changes lives. A changed life is a changed life. And that life changes lives. It's just an absolute fact. We're children of God. We are different. We're supposed to be different. We live, we do, we think, we act different. And the evidence of this change, this difference is love. But it's not any love, it's Jesus's love. A love that if we get it here, that's why we say this is the focus, it will come out here. Meet Jesus, be Jesus. It's as simple as that. Our vision, we want people to meet Jesus because then our mission is we go out and be Jesus. So what does Jesus, when he said, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, this change, this difference life that he makes, what does it look like? What does it really look like? So here's the first one I want you to write in. Here it is. A genuine impartiality. Say that with me. A genuine impartiality. Listen carefully. In the late 1700s, the manager of Baltimore's largest hotel refused lodging to a man who was dressed like a farmer. True story. The manager of the largest hotel refused lodging to a man who had happened to be dressed like a farmer. You see, he thought that the man's appearance would discredit his hotel. Now, I think we might understand that agreement. There are certain restaurants that you cannot go into, right? Without a suit or tie or at least a coat. My wife and I have been on a couple cruises and there's a dinner time that you have to eat in a different place if you don't have a coat, a suit coat. It's crazy, I know, but there's this this evidence they want it to be eloquent, right? They want it to be formal. They want it to be nice. Hence, the man thought that this man would not be good for his hotel. So he sent him away. Later that evening, it was shared with him that the man actually turned away the Vice President of the United States, Thomas Jefferson. (laughs) Think about that. Now, as you would imagine, this manager of the hotel immediately sent word to Mr. Jefferson apologizing and asked him to come back and be his guest. I want you to listen to what Thomas Jefferson wrote. This is so unbelievable, crazy reversal and living out the golden rule. Here's what he wrote. Sir, I have already engaged another room and I value your good intention highly. But if you have no place for a dirty American farmer, you have no place for the vice president of the United States. And isn't that what James wrote? Here's what he wrote. My dear brothers and sisters, How can you claim to have faith in your glorious Lord Jesus Christ if you favor some people over others? For example, suppose someone comes into your meeting dressed in fancy clothes and expensive jewelry and another comes in who is poor and dressed in dirty clothes. If you give special attention and good seat to the rich person, but you say the poor one, you can stand over there or else sit on the floor Doesn't this discrimination show that your judgments are guided by evil motives? Like I'm just simply saying, if Olympian Katie Ledecky came in today, 
how many of you would really want to meet her? But a homeless lady came in these doors. Would you feel the same? Now I will tell you this, Jesus loved them both. But he's not impressed by anything that they accomplished because he's the one that gave them the gift in the first place. That's why he says, in all things, you bring glory to my name. For the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh. I don't say that with any disrespect of Katie Ledecky. Been so proud of her watching her. And who knows how many more Olympics she still has. I just use that for an example. See, I get it. I want a fair shake, you want a fair shake. I want fair judgment, you want fair judgment. But shouldn't we expect anything less from ourselves when it comes to others? Look what the prophet Micah wrote. The Lord has told us what is good and what he requires. The Lord, the Lord has told us what is good. Here's what he requires. To do what is right, to do what is just, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. I want to leave that verse up here because I want you to notice something. Notice that he didn't say first, walk humbly with your God. I want you to catch this. Don't miss this. Because I hear Christians say, all I need is God. And that is biblical heresy from my standpoint. Because Jesus said, you want to know what the commandments are? I'll give you two. Love God with all your heart, soul, and mind and love your neighbor as yourself. In other words, they're equal. That's why Jesus said, how you love one another is, will prove to the world if you're really my disciple. In other words, don't think you're walking humbly with me if you're not being just, love, and mercy and being kind and doing all these other things. I will judge you, he said. In the end, Jesus said, I will separate the goats from the sheep and I will turn to the sheep. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you came and visited. I was in prison. I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. Welcome into my kingdom. He never says, cause you read the Bible and you loved me. You wanna come to heaven? I'll watch how you love others. Those are the words of Jesus. Genuine impartiality. Because Jesus might be in a small child who just needs your attention. Jesus might be in the exhausted wife who needs encouragement. Jesus might be in the frustrated laborer who just needs some recognition. Jesus might be in the grieving grandmother, the lonely shut-in, or the struggling neighbor. And I realize lots of these people have little to offer. But when you and I show genuine impartiality to the least of these, we're doing it to Jesus. We're doing it to Jesus. And now we're living out the golden rule. And that's the evidence of a changed, different life. C.S. Lewis wrote in his book, Mere Christianity, do not waste your time bothering whether you love your neighbor Act as if you do. For as soon as you do this, you will find one of the greatest secrets. You see, when you're behaving as if you love someone, you will presently come to love them. Love them. Amen? Amen. This is what John wrote. Dear friends, let us continue to love one another, for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God. Notice what he says. Anyone who loves, that's the children of the king. But, and you know how much I love buts, okay? But anyone who does not love does not know God. For God is love, because that's who God is. And if that's who God is, that's who we're supposed to be, right? God showed how much he loved us by sending his only son, his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. Here it comes. Dear friends, since God loved us that much, we surely ought to love each other. Genuine impartiality. Now that's golden. Someone say golden. Here's number two, a gracious respect. Say that with me, a gracious respect. Again, I don't know if you've been watching the Olympics, but there's been this French swimmer. His name is Leon Mershon. 
And he's just busting everybody's records, including the most decorated ever, not just swimmer, but the most decorated Olympian of all history, Michael Phelps. Watching a 22-year-old kid from another country and he's cheering him on. It's like bringing the greatest of joy. It's one of the coolest things. I mean, talk about an example, right? Talk about an example. Folks, to me, this is the real success stories. This is the golden rule really being lived out right in front of our eyes. When you and I can sincerely rejoice in the successes of others, when we as God's people exhibit such grace to someone who succeeds, who surpasses us in areas of our strengths and of our reputations. That's the golden rule. Is that your rule? Because there's not a lot of respect much in this world anymore. What I'm about to say, some of you might think, oh, he's just saying that. That'll be your decision to decide what you think in your own heart. I can't make you get it. This is the fourth time I've preached since Easter. I didn't even want to preach this weekend because two weeks ago I sat over there and watched a 25-year-old kid preach up here and tears are running down my cheeks. In fact, God gave me a vision and I won't even tell you what that is. It was so amazing. But I'm sitting there going, I felt like Michael Phelps watching a 25-year-old out preach me if you want to call it whatever you want to. It sat there the whole time and my joy in my heart was like, wow. I could not have done that when I was 25. And the joy that flooded my soul. Last week, I watched a 92-year-old guy get up here. Um, I don't remember anything he said, but I... I <laughs> but look what Paul writes. You want to know, some of you go, why do you do that? Because it's better than that, because I'm going to start crying when I think about Noah, okay? So, but look what Paul writes in Romans. We rejoice with those who rejoice. One of the joys that's been watching in so much of these Olympics, did anybody watch the picture of the gold and silver medalist of North Korea and South Korea smiling and taking a selfie together? What a picture of the golden rule. Several years ago, I don't know if you know, in the past Olympics, there were two different countries, one from Qatar, I believe it was, and another country, and they're competing in the high jump. This was brought to my attention. They're competing in the high jump. And they go, they're, they're actually, when they get done with it, they're at the exact same score. And so the judge comes over and says, this is how it works. You just got to keep going until one of you miss. Because there's always a gold, there's always a silver. And one of the Olympians looks at the guy and says, can't we both get gold? And the judge goes, sure. And they go berserk. They start jumping on each other and they each put the gold medal when they announce it on each other's, uh, around each other's neck. And I'm thinking, wow, whoever does it in a dog eat dog world, there's always one first and we're going to keep going even if I have to get silver. And they're like, why don't we just both be winners? And to watch that get played out, those are the kind of things that I'm like, that's what the golden rules, a gracious respect. But play with this on it. Let me, let me put this a little bit more personal. Can I do that with you? This, this is going to hurt a little, but you don't have to respond. Just think through this. Okay. You're at a professional hockey game. Okay. You're a professional hockey game. You know where they do those giveaways. They stop and they, they're like, we're going to do a big giveaway and we're going to focus on a section and they call it down all that stuff. You know what I'm talking about? Like locally, you might get a free burger or something. Okay. But the giveaway is a brand new car. It's a car that you've always wanted. And they start calling out the numbers, you know, your ticket. And they call out the blue seats. You're in the blue seat. They call out your section, 321. It's your section. Anybody feeling good right now? You ever had that moment? Then they call your row, row B. It's your row. And finally they call out seat 32. 
you're in seat 33. <laughs> Honestly, don't, don't, I'm being honest. Are you genuinely like, that's awesome. Or you're thinking, because he's also the guy who's been stealing your armrest the whole game. Right? what I'm talking about? Here's the deal is, you're probably not as excited. You were that close. I'm like, <sighs> told my wife to get 33. You know what I mean? I mean you, you know what I'm talking about. We come up with everything. Are we really genuinely excited? Here's the deal. If they'd have called a red zone, which is on the other side of the stadium, you'd be like, eh, whatever. Then you move on, look at your phone and don't care. But isn't it interesting when it gets closer to you, sometimes we want the success more than we want it for them. Do you have gracious respect? In humility, we just read it, value others above yourself. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of others. In Corinthians, he says, if one member is honored, every part, every part, every part rejoices with it. A gracious respect. Now that's golden. Someone say, that's golden. I want to invite the team out. Here's the last one. A godly compassion. Say that with me. A godly compassion. During Queen Victoria's reign, she heard about a woman, a common laborer, who had lost her child at birth. Having experienced deep sorrow herself, think about those words, the queen felt moved to express her sympathy. She not only reached out to the bereaved woman, she went to her house and spent the day. After she left, the neighbors came over and said, what did the queen say to you? What did the queen say to you? And here's what the grieving mother said. She never said a word. She simply put her hand on mine and we just wept the day together. Just as we read to rejoice with those who rejoice, the Bible also says we're to weep with those who weep like genuinely care, right? That's godly compassion. But here's my ask. When someone's going through a difficult time, do you only express empathy or do you actually suffer with them? Do you actually bleed with them? When one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. That's godly compassion. And that's golden. That's golden. Genuine partiality. Everybody matters. Gracious respect. You care more about others. You think about them more than yourself. What you get, what you got. Godly compassion. To actually weep and hurt and be with people. I want to invite Noah to the stage. We go to communion. What a time. A little short story to finish this up. A Sunday school teacher asked her class if they knew what the golden rule was. Here's what one little girl said. It's when I ask my mother for some toast and she always brings it to me covered with butter and jam. It's always the extra. It's always the extra. That's what Jesus said. Slap you in one cheek, give them the other. If they ask for your shirt, give them your coat. Don't worry about who it is. Just love, just love. Around here, we call it plussing everything. Just plus it. Whatever they need, do a little more. Whatever they want, do a little more. Isn't that what Jesus did on the cross? Talk about going the distance. No greater love, he'd lay his life down and he did. 